The following podcast is an exclusive presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Hey folks, Brian Keane here. You know, summer's over. We're entering the fall and then the winter. Halloween's coming up, Thanksgiving, and then of course the holiday shopping season. Speaking of the holiday shopping season, let me tell you about subculturecorsets.com. They've got everything you need for everyone on your list for this holiday season. Clothing, accessories, gifts, books, you name it, they've got it. They sponsor every show on the Project Entertainment Network, including this one. So please give them your business. Visit subculturecorsets.com. Three Guys with Beards, the Project Entertainment Network store, featuring T-shirts, mugs, stickers, the decent more from your favorite Project Entertainment Network podcasts. King Stain Squibbler's Rest. The Horror Show with Brian Keen. Why not show your loyalty by wearing a cool product from the podcast group and show off to your friends? It cooks. Armcast. The Mondo Method Monster Attack. Necrocastic. Go to projectentertainmentnetwork.com and click on the store tab for more details. The Liars Club Podcast. Bizarre. The Lunch Ladies Book Club. Matters of Faith. The Project Entertainment Network Store. Stacked with stuff from the best podcasts on the internet. The Curtain Jerkers. Buttercup of Doom. www.projectentertainmentnetwork.com There shall come a podcast. A podcast like no other. Defenders Dialogue with Brian Keane and Christopher Golden. Marvel Comics original superhero non-team convenes once again. The Incredible Hulk, the Savage Submariner, the Master of the Mystic Arts, Doctor Strange, and a dynamic supporting cast of Marvel superheroes battle against evil as the Defenders. Without further ado, true believers, here's your hosts, Brian Keane and Christopher Golden, Excelsior. Welcome back once again to another episode of Defenders Dialogue. I'm your host, Brian Keane. And I'm your other host, Christopher Gold. Look at that, you made me say other host, Brian. Well, I'm I'm thrown. This is the third podcast I've recorded today, Chris. So <laughs> I'm I'm a little I'm a little off my game, but you know what? Uh luckily, we're we're gonna break format this week. Usually it's just you and I yammering about comic books. This week we actually have a special guest joining us, uh, and he can do all the heavy lifting for us. That special guest is, of course, Scott Edelman. Now, Scott is the host of the popular Eating the Fantastic podcast. Uh, he's the author of a number of books, including What Will Come After, These Words Are Haunted, and Liars, Fakers, and the Dead Who Eat Them. His work in television includes Hanna-Barbera and Tales from the Dark Side and 13 years at the Sci-Fi Channel. Uh, but why is he on our show? Well, I'm asking that question right now, Brian and Chris. <laughs> well, I'll tell you why, Scott. You worked as an assistant editor for Marvel Comics starting in the early 70s. You wrote everything from display copy for superhero Slurpee, Kerps, Slurp, Slurpee Cups to the famous Bullpen's Bulletin's Pages. Uh, while you were there, you edited the Marvel-produced fan magazine, Foom. Uh, you created the Scarecrow, one of my favorite characters. Very we'll need to talk about the Scarecrow today. We do. Um, and then, of course, in 1976, you went freelance. You worked for both Marvel and DC. Uh, you wrote for Captain I Marvel. I got a regular Brian Bendis, aren't I? Master Kung Fu, Omega the Unknown, Weird War. Welcome back, Cotter. Yeah, you were. I mean, you were Bendis before there was a Bendis. <laughs> he was the proto-Bendis. He was well, the proto-Bendis. Um, you know what? My, I was, career... my only introduction would have been, Brian, that Scott Edelman worked at Marvel when people still said Excelsior and meant it. <laughs> well, when you had Stan Lee there in the corner office and you saw him every day, you had to mean it or else there'd be trouble. Yeah. I like that. So I guess, well, let, let you know, Scott, the reason we have you on today, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, in the, in the sh- chronology of our show, we are up to Giant Size Defenders issue number five. And that was among your very first work for Marvel, was it not? It was not only among my very first work for Marvel. It was the very first comic book ever that had a credit of mine on it. So that was July 1975 is when it was published. And the way things work, it probably came out two or three months earlier. So let's say 
let's say April of 75. It might have come out even on my 20th birthday. Who knows when I turned 20? Because I turned 20 March 31, 1975. So uh, that would have been a good present. But uh, that was it. And the credit box, it's an extremely weird credit <laughs> box, as you may have already noted. Shall I do the dramatic reading of it? Or, sure. Or Go right ahead. Know? Well, this is from Giant Size Defenders number five, and it goes like this. You won't believe this, but I didn't believe it either. You won't believe this, but Steve Gerber, Jerry Conway, Roger Schleifer, Len Wein, Chris Claremont, and Scott Edelman plotted this tale. Steve scripted it. Don Heck drew it. Mike Esposito inked it. Dave Hunt inked the backgrounds and lettered it. G. Russo, that's George. G. Russo colored it. Len edited it. Coffee and moral support were provided for a price by the Lantern Coffee Shop on 53rd Street, and Carla made the meatloaf. Once you've read it, the story, not the meatloaf, you may wonder why. Answer, why not? <laughs> and that, so that's is, the kind is that of, pretty accurate? Is that how it went down? That That is how it went. The Lantern was a gathering place where we all hung out. Many other things happened in that Lantern Coffee Shop, including... When I was asked to write an issue of Omega the Unknown, uh, which was also Steve Gerber related, we could talk about that if you want to as well, but you never knew what was going to happen uh, there. It was a very anarchic, disorganized place, and people would get pulled into plotting sessions if they just happened to be hanging around the office. I was there in the room when Len Wein and Dave Cockrum were plotting Giant Says X-Men number one. And, you know, just people tossing out ideas. And, and that's how that one worked. We were all out to, to dinner one night, and uh, we all were tossing out ideas. And, and if you're going to ask me the question, well, Scott, in this giant size offenders, which one of the ideas is yours? I cannot answer that question. I have, I have read and reread the issue to see, is, does my memory extend 42 years back to, uh, you know, to tell me, uh, you know, which little sentence or which panel might have been the one I coughed up, and I'm afraid I cannot answer that question. It must be a mystery. Well, I just I want to ask you just, Scott, a question in general about Defenders, because, you know, when Brian and I came up with the idea of doing this show, it was really just a whim. It was like a message, because I know that Defenders is not only his favorite comic of all time, but his first comic, um... And it's not my first, uh, but it's certainly one of my favorites. And I just have been so passionate about it um, because it's such an oddball book from beginning to end, no matter who was writing it. Um, and the collection of heroes by design was such an oddball collection that I think a lot of people, a lot of like hardcore Marvel 70s fans still sort of look at it as, oh, yeah, and then there's that book. But we have this passion for this book. And I just wondered sort of like, if you want to set the scene for what the, what were the attitudes within the halls of Marvel at the time about the Defenders? You know, uh, why did it ex why did it exist and why did it continue to exist? Well, it began before I began at Marvel. So those early issues that you were talking about uh, back in the first episodes, long, long ago, in the early days of Defenders Dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, those were before my time, you know, when Roy started doing it. And then I always loved that wonderful Neil Adams cover, that first cover with the three of them, uh, you know, running at us. But the odd thing about the Defenders, I think, is that more than any other book, it obtained the personality of the creator in a way that other books did not. As if when people were writing the Fantastic Four or the Avengers, yeah, the personality of the author got in there. The, you know, Roy's different than Stan's and, and so on. But as was shown with what Steve Gerber did with the Defenders and what Dave Kraft would do later with the Defenders, uh, for some reason, because the team always changed, you never knew who was going to be there, uh, each issue had somehow allowed the writer of the book to go a lot weirder and often different tangents and directions than other books did. And I don't know, that may be why people liked it. It may be that there were some people who only liked the Defenders of certain writers and certain teams. So, Maybe that's why, uh, you know, it has that strange reputation. You couldn't say, you know, if you picked up an issue of the, of the event, well, the Avengers changed a lot, but it, I think it had more stability than the, the Defenders did. It had less of a chance of something weird going on. It had fewer elves with guns. Uh, <laughs> well, right there, that's a problem. But it also had, you know, the Avengers had 
that flagship feel. It had the feel of, these are our major characters together. And the Defenders had the feeling of, these are the characters no one else is paying attention to. You know, um... Anyway, go but ahead. I think I think more people paid attention to the defenders than you know the next group, and in my head I'm thinking the champions came after the defenders. Perhaps yes. I'm wrong as to when it happened. No, correct. But you know, but it was another attempt to take heroes that maybe didn't quite fit together, and let's see if we can put them together and and, and have another book. And and probably there would not have been a champion had there not been uh, a defenders before it. And what's interesting, we'll find out later as this podcast progresses, uh, the last incarnation of the Defenders was pretty much half the champions, um, you know, right. with, with Angel uh-huh. and et cetera. So we'll find that out later. But so, you know, I've I've done the the creative summits uh, DC when when Greg Rucka and I were still part of Future's End. They brought us all to New York for a week and we sat inside DC's headquarters and the big conference room with Dan Didio and Joey Cavallari and, and we brainstormed ideas. Uh, you know, Marvel is of course famous for their creative summits, creator summits where it's, it's the same thing. Uh, but I'm, I'm just, I'm fascinated that seventies Marvel, you know, this, this giant size issue of the defenders is, is basically being pitched at the lantern coffee shop on 53rd street. Um, I, I mean that, that sort of chaos really lends itself to the book's creativity. Well, none of the things that Steve Gerber got away with or that certain other people like, let's say, Don McGregor, who I consider similar in many ways uh, to Steve Gerber and what he was able to pull off at Marvel, could not have happened in the era of a creative summit. It could only happen because there was total anarchy. It could only happen because the inmates were in charge of the asylum. Um I mean, if you think of one of the pivotal events of Marvel long, long before Steve Gerber, I mean, just think of the Silver Surfer, let's say, uh, and how it happened and surprised Stan Lee. You know, the, the whole idea was, you know, they came up with this book and the artwork came in from Jack Kirby and Stan Lee sees it and says, why is there a guy on a skateboard, uh, on a surfboard, uh, Jack? And it just sort of snuck up on him. Um, well, at that point, there was a stand watching what happened before things saw print. But what happened during the days when I was there, often the editor didn't know what was going on until the book was lettered and drawn and on the way of the printer and sometimes didn't know what was going on until it came out and would read the book. Um, and, you know, and that's the only way that they could get some of these things through. I mean, when you think about the fact that Howard the Duck came about by accident, nobody knew Howard the Duck existed until it was already drawn and inked and, you know, and so forth. <laughs> so that people were doing what they wanted to do. It really was not until the time of Jim Shooter when he took over as editor. And one of the first things he did was said, OK, I want to see plots from everybody before any book is drawn. Right. I don't want this happening, this stuff that happened in the past. So a lot of what happened with Steve Gerber and a lot of the things you've been looking at in the past issues snuck by and a lot of things were sneaking by uh, in those days and you can't get away with that anymore. We talked uh, on last week's episode about, you know, Gerber's Sons of the Serpents, uh, Sons of the Serpent saga um, and just, you know, how it it really touched on, you know, the racial strife and, and things that were going on in the 70s in a, in a way that no other Marvel comic had at the time. Um, do you ever remember him getting blowback for that or any, anything else he did specifically in the defenders? You know, I honestly don't because, well, if you remember when Stan would have his statements in the, uh, Stan soapbox, part of the bullpen bullets page talking about what he was doing with racial issues and what he would answer in letter columns. And he would say things like, well, yeah, even if we're doing it wrong, it's better we do it wrong than not do it at all. You know, but sometimes people would write in and say, oh, it's a little bit clumsy how you're trying to handle this racial thing. And, you know, Stan's answer would always be, well, at least we're trying. You know, it's better to try to make a statement than to not try at all. So uh, I have a feeling that in terms of an issue like that, th- there was no uh pushback and you know to bring up don mcgregor i remember him getting more pushback because he did a whole thing with the black panther versus the ku klux klan 
And I guess once you start bringing in a real world, uh, element, then it becomes more of an issue. And you know, you're not going to start getting letters from the Sons of the Serpent organization saying, hey, you mischaracterized this you know, issue of the fan. In 2017, um, you might. <laughs> that's right. Before we know it's out there someday, you're going you're gonna to start getting texts from people, you two, when this episode airs. But I don't remember anything. As I said, I do remember with Don McGregor and the clans. Uh, I don't remember anything with what Steve was doing. Uh, you know, with the, the defenders and the sun, the serpent people. Right. So, you know, on, so. on last week's episode, Scott, we talked a lot about um, how we felt Gerber had had changed the paradigm at Marvel with the way he approached character. And I know it was all written in a sort of chaotic uh, era, but um, but it really felt like he was taking a different approach. Did you feel that? Did you think that at the time? Did that? Oh, I, I very much did. I, I very much felt that way. And it all sort of leads up into my whatever success or failure I had in uh, Marvel. I was thinking about there are many different types of writers who come into comics. There are the ones who come in and they are trying to be another writer. You know, they're like you come in and you say, well, I'm Roy Thomas being Stan Lee. Or when I came in, I, I'm trying to be Roy Thomas being Stan Lee. I mean, there are people who come in and they just say, well, I'm going to just try and do what was done when I was younger and do the comics I liked and not really try and reinvent what's happening or change the paradigm for what's happening with comics. And someone like Steve who came in, now he came in and he was under the radar. He came in, I remember he was doing a Submariner, I think, uh, before he did the Defenders. And he could have just been like any other, and he was just like any other writer. You sort of come in, in disguise, and then after a while you break out and say, okay, enough of this. I'm going my own way. I'm writing my own path. Uh, I'm going to use comics to tell the stories that I want to tell. And that's what I think he did on defenders and that's what i think he did when he got a hold of man thing as well my feeling about me in comics is i never really did that and by the time i decided wait a second i don't just have to try and be roy thomas being stanley <laughs> i can be me i can write the comics that only i could write that no one else could write and that was exactly when it all fell apart and i got out of comics <laughs> so i never really I never really, I, I really only, uh, you know, had that decision um, just as I was doing my last issue of Captain Marvel. And I'm horrified to tell you when I had that decision, and I had totally forgotten when I realized this. I went back and read uh, the columns I wrote for the Comics Journal. I had written a series of ethics columns after I got out of the comics and just basically talked about you know, what was going on with women in comics and why they weren't getting breaks and, and all sorts of other things and uh, how people hide themselves. And it turned out that I was having a conversation and I went and found this. I wrote one called Comic Chameleon, which is the title of one of my ethics columns and your listeners can find it on my site, scottedelman.com. But I was having a conversation with Jim Shooter at the urinals at Marvel Comics. <laughs> <laughs> and having a discussion, I did not remember this until I read me writing this in that column about, yes, I'm by the urinals with Jim Shooter having a conversation about why aren't my comic books standing out from the other comic books who are being written at the time and why is no one paying attention? And then all of a sudden I realized, well, wait a second, I'm just pretending to be someone else. I should not be a chameleon and try and blend in. I should be like, you know, Steve Gerber, like Don McGregor, these people who are saying, I'm going to do whatever the heck I want and use the comics medium to tell the stories that I want to tell rather than saying, oh boy, I'll write a new story about the Team Brigade or something like that, which is, you know, often what can happen. You can get in there and say, I'm going to fill in all the cracks of all the untold stories of the past of the characters and you're just sort of you're contributing to the Marvel Universe in a small way, but you're not breaking any new ground with things. And Steve Gerber was one of those people uh, who very quickly cast off that shell that he snuck in under the cover of, oh, I'm just trying to you know, be another person, another fanboy type writer telling stories or like all the other stories. And he broke out of that very quickly. Uh, you know, it's very clear with what he was doing on Defenders, the things he was doing with Valkyrie. 
that he that other people would not have done. They would have just made her a tough board with a sword and not dealt with all the various identity issues. May not have brought in her her confused husband, uh, you know, as part of the story. So, right. you know, I think it was very clear back then that he was doing something different. Now, you knew Gerber fairly well. Um, I, I would mention to our, our readers, uh, I think it's still available. There's a, a an interview you conducted with Steve Gerber back in the day available on YouTube. Is there, is there not? Yes. When I edited Fool Magazine, I had this idea, and I guess it just goes back to my Eating the Fantastic podcast. That I, I was trying to have people learn about who people are by having conversations with them. And when I took over Foom, Marvel's fan magazine, which stands for Friends of Old Marvel, of course, that I would run the news column as a series of interviews with people. So they would get not just the factual stuff about what was coming up in issues, but I would also uh, sort of get some of the personality and the banter back and forth between me and them. And I Thank God that is the one tape of all the tapes I did back then. I would have said in the 75 and 76, I was interviewing Marv Wolfman and Len Wein and Steve and, and Don McGregor, all the writers back then. And his is the only tape that survived. So I digitized it and put it up on YouTube. And, uh, you know, to hear him talk about what his plans are for the character. And, and there's a second one in which he talks about editing Crazy Magazine, which was marvel's mad magazine clone which again he talks in that interview about how mad magazine is not funny you know no one knows how to do a humor magazine he sort of went off in his own way uh not just trying to be a a spin-off of, of mad so well crazy I people... much i mean much like the defenders crazy during his tenure it was subversive i mean I, you know i read mad i read cracked I read crazy. I know our listeners might be surprised by that. You know, Chris was reading Team Beat and Bananas while I was reading. No, no, no. Tiger Beat was my favorite. Tiger Beat. Brian. Uh, but I, I, of course, you know the correct title. But you know, <laughs> no, crazy. no, no. I was collecting the uh, the Don Martin paperbacks, the Mad Magazine Don Martin. We're we're mm. tangenting here madly, but no pun intended. But I had the that was what I was collecting. Of course, I read yeah. those, but you know. Well, one the of the black things, and white Marvel horror magazines. Those were my. Was, yeah, one was thing Gerber, people most most remember Crazy Magazine for, if they remember it at all, is for Casper the Dead Baby, which is a tangent, which was drawn by Marie Severin when he figured, well, wait a second, if you have Casper who is a baby, he had to have been killed when he was a baby. So it's this just terrific thing about what half like a five or six page story about the living Casper and what happens to him to make him into a ghost. But that oh, was I, I remember it well. Else. Yeah. But, if, you know, given that, that, I mean, you knew who your audience was back then. Now, yeah, college-age kids were reading comics as well. People your age were reading them. But primarily, it was guys like Chris and I, or girls like, I don't mean, as I said, I've recorded three podcasts today. I'm tired. It was, it was children, me and Chris's age, primarily reading these books. And for him to be working all this subversive stuff in, I, I mean, did... Did he have bigger goals? Did was 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 he trying to entertain, or was there a, a whole sub level that he was really reaching for? Well, two things. One, I should point out that though with children, the rules have changed over the years. If you go back and read about what the editors at DC always used to say, and even at Marvel, the concept was every seven years you had a totally new audience, so you could do the same story that you did for Superman seven years later because no one's around anymore this is before fandom and that really started changing once comic collecting came in in the 70s and uh i know stan was always very proud hey we're being read by college students and you know we're not just being read by little kids so there was that feeling that an older audience was reading it uh you know but definitely uh, Steve was very much aware of that um it, yes when you do your ma giant size man thing uh podcast you could talk about some more of that but you know but some of the things he was doing in there as well were dealing with um you know very uh you know heavy issues and uh, you know depression and suicide and oh, yeah. you know, teen, teen bullying and and all that stuff so i think he was very much aware that you should be able to handle 
any issue that you would be able to handle in a novel, you should be able to handle in a comic book. Of course, there was the comics code uh, issue and all of that, uh, you know, back and forth with the comics code. Because when I was there, you were still having to submit uh, copies of the original printed artwork before it went to the printer. And they had to review every page and make suggestions for changes uh, if they found something offensive. So you still had that looking over your shoulder. That took a while to, you know, to totally fall apart. Uh, but, oh, definitely, his ambitions were much larger. Uh, I, I don't want to say much larger than comic books, because that's wrong. Uh, it, that makes it sound as if he would have thought that comic books were small and not worthy of them, and, oh, someday I'll write a novel kind of thing. That's not what I mean uh, by that. But he felt that comics could do more than they had been doing uh, can speak more broadly than they had been and can comment on things in a more honest way. So he was uh, trying to do that. And, and he was a funny guy. I mean, one of the things, uh, it's, it's hard for people to tell from the book and even hearing his voice when I do that little interview for people who want to you know, go listen to it, you really can't quite tell what a funny guy uh, Steve was in real life to hang around with. Uh, and I can remember one particular uh, time because no one really ever separated at Marvel. You you went to the movies together, you played poker together, you went out to dinner together. Uh, I mean, for all I know, this giant size Defenders number five was not planned. It was just an impromptu thing of Steve saying, "Oh, I got to do this issue. What should what should it be?" And it just sort of happened. And, you know, and I remember us wandering the streets in midtown Manhattan and doing guerrilla theater spontaneously. I remember throwing myself on the ground once after we left a restaurant and, and putting my hands around his legs and going, Dad, please come home. Mom misses you. And she, you know, she wishes you'd stop drinking. And, you know, and he's going back and we're just going back and forth. And people are walking by us on the street going, what, what's going on with these people? But, you know, things like that. Uh, you know, it just happened because back then it really was an extended family. And you know, if you if it was Friday and for people who don't remember the old days, a new movie might open and it might open in a single theater in Manhattan. It would not open in 40 theaters. You know, it might open in one or two. If on Friday you went to the first show of a brand new movie you generally find most of the people in comics going to see that same movie even if it was unplanned right. um, and you just sort of all were in each other's pockets all the time playing softball on the weekend having parties and so on so you know so there was a lot of that and uh you know and steve was a part of that and uh, he you know he was always a he was always a funny guy and the sad thing about his passing among Others uh, is it became a more public thing thanks to the emergence of the internet and the fact that he was on Live Journal and I can recall just I don't know remember now if it was the day before he passed or just a couple of days before he passed just blogging about oh he's in the hospital waiting for I think it was a lung transplant and you know yep. talking about how uh, oh, I'm working on this book and I think everything is going to be okay and you know I think it's going to come through and then the next day is gone and that's uh, a side effect of the wired world we live in that uh, i can remember back when i was first in fandom and someone might die and it would be months before you picked up a fanzine like locusts or something like that and say oh look robert heinlein died two months ago or something like that and, and now you are thanks to facebook and twitter you are privy to information that once only the family would have so it right. became a much more shocking thing when it happened because, of, wait a second, we were just talking to this guy yesterday. He was so full of hope. He was writing some book for DC. I don't remember what the what book he was working on at the time that he passed. But, you know, the suddenness of it uh, I think was, it was more uh, I think it was Hard Time he was working on for DC. Yeah. Yeah. The, the so, book about the uh, the juvenile who attempts to shoot up his school and ends up getting sentenced as, as an adult in the penitentiary. Really good stuff. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. yeah no, never... so he, he went out on top. He was not, uh, did, he didn't uh, just start churning things out. He was always in there. And it, and it, was, it was interesting to see what happened, if not for the, you know, the whole Howard the Duck thing and you know, anger with Marvel and rights and all those, that kind of thing. But well, uh, he had know, a brilliant you brought, career. That, you brought that up. That's something I've always wondered. Now, I... I Corresponded very briefly with Steve Gerber. 
when my first novel came out, I got a chance to tell him, you know, that he's the reason I'm doing this for a living. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I can't say I knew him well or anything like that. But one thing I always wanted to ask him, you know, we've we've talked about how in in the Defenders, even early in his run, there are those pages that are almost full prose. Um, and. You know, later later on, after everything happened with Howard the Duck, and and you know he he, he got screwed in a way that nobody, perhaps, uh, you know, maybe Jack Kirby got screwed. But but uh, why did he never attempt to do more prose, or just to do straight prose, or did he? And we just didn't hear about it. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm afraid I don't have the answer to that. Yeah. Yeah. I, have I mean, few... I know it. Go ahead. Sorry, Scott. No, you're right. Well, I just know he enjoyed doing that within the comics. I know he enjoyed being playful within the comics and having those text pages. And it was something we were just talking about in the last issue, the full page of the speech by the head of the Ser- Sons of the Serpent, where it was just a giant block of prose. And he did a lot of that in Man-Thing uh, as well. So he used it when he felt it aided the story that he was trying to tell in comics. So I'm, as to why I did the... Uh, never went and wrote a novel or anything like that, I can't really say. And I, I should make sure I put out there that I, I don't make it sound as if I was the, you know, the closest friend he had in the world or anything. Right. I, was one of, I was just one of many people in this bizarre bullpen family that occurred uh, from when I started work at Marvel in 74 and when I got out of comics in, in 81. And you know, in that period, everybody was just with everybody. Uh, and there was some contact after that, but there are many people who are far, far closer to him than, than I would have been. So I don't want, I would just want to make sure that's out there. That's... Did he ever confide in you or anybody else in the bullpen? I know what you're going to ask. I was just going to ask the same question. Go ahead. The elf with a gun? Is <laughs> yeah, that what you're going to ask? <laughs> and we don't want to spoil the ending of the elf with a gun saga for our listeners, but did he ever confide in you where that was going? Or, or no, no, that, that was part of the, the anarchy that we were saying. That, you know, I mean, these days you would have had a summit and you would have had to say, oh, well, this is seated for this thing that's happening down the road. Don't worry, there'll be a payoff. And they would have to tell what that payoff would be. Uh, I mean, back then in those days, things just happened. And, uh, you know, nobody really was in charge for a while. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the books would get drawn and the, you know, the books would get uh, sent to the printer and then the books would get looked at when they came out and sometimes the editor would go, what? Who said you could do this? Well, nobody said I can do it, but nobody was watching what was going on. Yeah, so. I actually feel like, and it's funny, Brian, that literally was the question I was going to ask before. I, I actually feel like any answer to that question would be a letdown. It would. So no matter what it is, like he's secretly Galactus, that's a letdown. I mean, whatever it is, it's just not like, you know, he's a doom bot. I don't care. It's a letdown. But I, you know, t- just to totally like uh, geek out, Scott, a little bit uh, less seriously, I was just curious, as a fan, uh, what your favorite Defenders characters were. Like, you know, what, do, you know, what, what, what did you like best as far as the you know, the series and which characters did you like to see in its run? Well, I, of course, well, I maybe I shouldn't say of course, but you know, the Hulk is always there, uh, you know, at the top of the list uh, because he's, he's the Hulk and the way that he was handled uh, in the Defenders, I think was sometimes nicer than in his own book. I mean, because in his book, he's alone. Right. I mean, that's basically, I mean, the the story in the Hulk, though, you know, he has an occasional friend here and there. That's just basically the story with no social life. And uh, he's Frankenstein wandering around, accidentally killing people, you know, that kind of thing. And in the Defenders, he has a family. Uh, and it was always good to see him um, under those circumstances. And more uh, entertaining, right? I mean, that's the thing. I, I feel like he's more entertaining in the Defenders because of that. Agree. He's humanized. Yes. Uh, well, because you very rarely got to see him you know, banter with people in that way and give people nicknames the way Sawyer did on Lost. You know <laughs> that that was, you know, that he would do that all, and that was one of the fun aspects of it that that would come up. So, 
Um, he, I mean, he was always the favorite. I don't think Doctor Strange was anyone's favorite simply because of the way you discussed what a dick he is. I know that was that's been the theme that has run through Defenders dialogue from the beginning. <laughs> was that uh, the feeling inside the Marvel bullpen as well? <laughs> well. Well, it is interesting that that he was and seemed a nicer person in his own book than he seemed in the Defenders. Maybe he's yeah. someone with low social skills, and that's what it is. And he, you know, he we got along with one or two people, but you put them together with a group, and it didn't didn't work well. He does become, real. He becomes a very paternal figure, though. You know, he doesn't sort of start out that way, but he kind of becomes, you know, and not in the Charles Xavier like. Um, admonishing way, really. You know, Xavier had that uh, uh, sort of very sort of above it all sense. Eventually, over time, Doctor Strange becomes this uh, this figure who's really trying to help them all sort out their shit. Um, he's still arrogant as hell, but he's he's a he's not the way he starts. You know, at the beginning, the first few episodes, we just talked about how he's just such a nasty son of a bitch all the time. Um, but he does change into a, a sort of paternal. What about some of the more oddball well, characters? Well, Sorry, I think ahead. what he ends up changing into is he sort of changes into what Captain America became in the Avengers. Right. Because Captain America was not there at the beginning, gets found in that block of ice. And eventually, as people come and go, he's sort of the one who holds it all together. He's sort of the one who helps the other people. Uh, so I, not that. I don't think Captain America was ever a dick. He can't be one. He's he's always that nice nice guy who's you know apple pie and all that. But um, you know, so that's sort of what Doctor Strange, I guess, ended up eventually becoming, just by the benefit of him being around so long and people coming and going. Perhaps he ended up feeling more invested in the Defenders than the uh, uh, you right. know than other people. And the fact uh, that his house became a, essentially a superhero commune. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, and, and, you know, other ones you, you were getting at, you know, who else? I mean, Luke Cage is very high up there. Um, though, you know, though, of course, reading it with 2017 eyes versus 1975 uh, eyes, 76 eyes and so forth, uh, you look at that and say, well, all that sweet Christmas is a bit uh, a, a bit too much. And, uh, you know, the characterization and so forth, you do sort of, uh, you know, wince at it, all of us white guys trying to pretend to be you know, Luke Cage. So that does, you know, stand out a bit after all this time. But still, there were even even then, because as I said earlier, what Stan said, better to do it and be a little clumsy at it than not to have tried to do it at all. Uh, I think it still stands out, and he stands out as as one of the more important characters in the book. Yeah, for sure. Great. Um, you know, we'd be remiss, and we can come back to the Defenders in a second, Brian, but we'd re- be remiss, Scott, if we didn't talk about um, the Scarecrow, because as horror guys, um, now the, if I recall correctly, there it's only it's three ap- appearances, right? Well, I ended up killing a lot of books with that. <laughs> it, it, uh, the very first appearance of the Scarecrow was in the final issue, and I always like to point out that, as with Spider-Man, it appeared in the final issue of what had previously been a book that just collected short monster and horror stories. This is Dead <laughs> so of Night. Both Dead of Night, yes. Yeah, Dead of Night, number 11. So it, it had a very strange history back then was marvel was getting heavily into the horror business and deciding they needed more books they had all those black and white books it was originally supposed to have appeared in a book called monsters unleashed Mm -hmm. which was one of marvel's black and white books that was supposed to you know rotate there with a couple of other horror characters well i came up with it and then that got canceled then the scarecrow was supposed to appear as a backup feature in giant size werewolf and it was supposed to rotate with Tigra, and then that book got canceled. And then finally they said, okay, let's just throw it in this reprint book as the last issue. And it was immediately going to go into his own book. It, it even appeared in subscription ads. So you really? Subscribed to the Scarecrow. Yeah, it was oh, in the I didn't know that. Ads. And then before the first issue could come out, the book was canceled. Uh, it so what was to have been the Scarecrow number one actually appeared in Marvel Spotlight number 26 
as opposed to being in his own title. Right. And I recently discovered uh, the undrawn, never drawn, never used plot for what was to have been the Scarecrow number two and posted it on my blog just last week because I was going through some old paper and I say, wow, I didn't remember I ever wrote this. And uh, uh, But the only thing that ever was drawn of that was a Don Perlin splash page and he did the splash page for that issue, and that's all that exists of what was supposed to have been the Scarecrow number two. So it had a checkered history before it ever got soft print, going through three titles, and then this whole mess afterwards. But you know, the, well, if, no, if you look in some Marvel books at the time, you could have actually sent in your dollar or whatever a 12 issue subscription was back then and subscribed to the Scarecrow. I don't know what kids took in exchange for that. I don't know if anyone sent in their money to subscribe to it, but... It was out there, and then it got canceled. What was the reason for the cancellation? Were they just they were gearing back on horror, or well, it's the back? Marvel explosion implosion. It's oh well, we've got too many titles out there, so there are a whole bunch of, of titles that did not come out. I can't off the top of my head remember the other ones that didn't happen or the other books that were canceled at the same time. But it just it, you know it just was one of the ones that. Uh, that didn't make it. So uh, I don't really know what was going to happen next. Uh, I am mystified by the blurb that I have at the end of that plot for the Scarecrow number two. What would have been the Scarecrow number two? Because it says, next issue, the supernatural turns superhero. So I don't know if we were going to try and have him now that he defeated his initial creation myth story, uh, if he was then going to begin entering more into the Marvel uh, universe the way you know the way Morbius, uh, the living vampire, did. I mean, he just right. started off as a one-off, but then he started having villains of his own and adventures of his own. And uh, and again, this is forty years ago. You know, we so, should, uh, I was just gonna say we should say for those of those of you who are listening, do not confuse Scott's Scarecrow character with any other character at Marvel or DC for that matter who goes by the moniker Scarecrow. It's a different character. Agreed. Um, very unique take. Great horror story that uh, would be that I wish that Marvel didn't own Scott um, because there are you know, there are lots of other things you could do with it. But it's it's great work. And then the character subsequently appeared, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, in Marvel Two and One. Is that right? Yes, Marvel. So Bill Mantlo, who, by the way, we are recording this on his birthday, of all things. It is Bill Mantlo's birthday. Who, Happy uh, birthday, Bill Mantlo. Who, who most people will know as the co-creator of Rock. Oh, we lost you there, Scott. Are you still there? I'm still here. Oh, go ahead. Say that again. As the co-creator of. Bill Manlo is the co-creator of Rocket Raccoon, who people know from Guardians of the Galaxy. So if that's probably what he is known most famously for. But when the Scarecrow was canceled, they said, oh, well, we've got to wrap this up somehow. They decided to wrap it up in Marvel 2-in-1 uh, with the thing. And uh, his girlfriend, who is uh, Alicia, I, if I remember her name correctly, the, Masters, yep. the, the blind sculptress, sculptor. Uh, and that was sort of the reason to make the art connection with the scarecrow painting and all that, and uh, and sort of end it. Now it's not really the ending that I would have anticipated, considering what was in that plot I recently uh, found. And who knows what I was going to be doing next when it would actually be a series. Uh, but yes, it did get so those three books. Uh, did conclude that. Now, the Scarecrow eventually came back as a Doctor Strange villain, renamed the, in the Marvel Universe, they now call him Straw Man, and he became one of the Fear Lords who fought Doctor Strange alongside uh, Nightmare, uh, who was a Doctor Strange villain, right. and I can't remember the other two. And in fact, they are doing a Marvel Masterworks Fear Lords collection, collecting all the stories really? of Doctor Strange versus the Fear Lord, the early Scarecrow stories, and I did write an introduction uh, to that book that will be coming out from Marvel, I think, in February. Uh, so it's a, it's a Masterworks, the big hardcover Masterworks? Well, or? I don't know if it's a, a Masterwork, or I don't know if it's an Essential. I, I'm not, I can't remember exactly. You know what, I think I remember but, seeing that. I'm going to look it up right now while we talk. But also, uh, you know, the thing is, it seems to me like, you know, 
this is a this is a time as a as a fan that I'd love to see uh, I'd love to see a new a new take on that. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. January 9th, Doctor Strange: The Lords of Fear, uh, and yeah, it includes is- issues of Thor um, and those uh, three Scarecrow stories, and then a whole bunch of Doctor Strange materials. Right, Very it cool. includes the early Nightmare stories and the early stories of whoever else or the other Fear Lords who I forget who they are all of a sudden now. But I think Roy Thomas wrote an eventual miniseries where Doctor Strange, a six-issue miniseries or something, and uh, that's collected in there as well. So that will be coming up. Cool. Well, now, Just, Chris, you... Ap- uh, I was going to say, Brian, before ahead. you start, apropos of nothing, and nobody else can see this because we're just listening, there you go. There's the first Rocket Raccoon right there. Uh, yeah, Marvel. Chris is holding up a Marvel preview with Satana on the cover. Yeah, Marvel preview number seven with Satana, which I'm actually going to be selling because it's Doc, it's Rocket Raccoon's first appearance, and I I have it printed elsewhere, and it's a you know value. I actually have two of them. So anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say you you brought up uh, the Scarecrow, aka Straw Man, is ripe for reinvention. Now Scott knows this because I I've told him this privately off the air, but I don't think you know. I actually pitched uh, a revival of that character uh, for Marvel's Dead of Night relaunch that they did under their their Max title, their their right. adult oriented material. Um, and you know, my editor at the time, Warren Simon, seemed to like it. Tom Brevoort seemed to like it. Unfortunately, then Warren left the company to go to Valiant, and I was sort of orphaned and didn't have anybody to pitch to. So it it was kind of DOA, but. But, yeah, maybe I'll throw that pitch up on my website for people to look at for free. Well, the yeah. thing I would really like you to pitch up and put up on that website, Brian, is something that you revealed to me is that when you were a little uh, Brian Keene, you actually drew comics of the Scarecrow, did you tell me? Once? I did. And so somewhere out there, there's little drawings of, what, 10-year-old Brian drawing uh, or something? Or seven year, seven-year-old Brian. They are in my mother's cedar chest. Along with all the other, yeah, I, I drew, because I didn't know about intellectual property rights back then. I had DC, I had Commandy and, and Scarecrow and and uh, the Headman, everybody <laughs> else. This, 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 and, you know, they're all stick figure bodies. And it, but, yeah, I should, uh, I should get into my mom's cedar chest. Yeah, I would love to see camera. a page or two of that. Yeah. Well, hey, remember, that was how Jim Shooter started anyway. He didn't send in scripts. He sent in little pencil drawings, and that's how he started writing the Legion of Superheroes back in the 60s. Yeah. You know, so you could have started back then, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's, uh, it's always been one of those things that you look at and you think, boy, I wish they'd done more of this i'm sure no one more than you wishes they had done more than that scott but uh or maybe not because it sounds like you didn't know where it was going after no no i did know when it was going back in 1976 (laughs) i don't know i don't know what my 1976 self was thinking back then you were ahead of the Uh, game though because werewolf by night took like 39 issues before he became a superhero (laughs) good point i waited until he could talk (laughs) <laughs> and that would have been interesting, considering that uh, Don Perlin was the premier artist on Werewolf. By, well, my, it was Mike Plug and you know, Don Perlin, but uh, mm. since Don Perlin was the one who was taking over on the Scarecrow as a regular permanent artist, rather than being sent to the Philippines, because that's something you might not know. Those early two issues of the Scarecrow were not done in the Marvel method; they were done full script. Because uh, any time you were dealing with the artists in the Philippines, we did do a complete full script. So the writer would be in charge of panel one, panel two, panel three, panel four, and all that. Uh, so that, that the one that Rico Raval did in Dead of Night number 11 and Ruben Yandok did in Marvel Spotlight 26 were off a of full script. But with Don, it would have gone back to the the quote-unquote Marvel method, and uh, that's what people will see if they go to my blog and just search on the Scarecrow tag, they will find that if you want to know what that last issue was supposed to be and which of the two brothers was supposed to end up actually being the Scarecrow and, and a variety of other things and how the cult of Kalamai ends up, that's in that plot. In an alternate universe separate from Marvel 2 and one, the one with the thing. <laughs> So it was fun. Though I did I did find an old interview talking about things I forgot, in which supposedly at one point I was going to be allowed to wrap it up in a backup feature. 
And just to bring it all the way around to the Defenders again, um, since my other connection with the Defenders, in addition to plotting that giant size number five, is I have a backup feature in, let us see here, uh, the Defenders number uh, 54, we, you're far away from that, December 1977, I have a Nick Fury backup in there. I remember it well. Because there was a period when everyone was late with every single comic book, and they thought, oh, if we got them to draw 15-page stories and write 15-page stories instead of 20- and 21-page stories and did a backup, they will catch up. And as a result, I got to write many, many backup stories. And at one point, I was told, oh, well, you'll be able to do a scarecrow sometime in order to really wrap up all the loose ends. Uh, that never happened, but you know, it did result in my other Defenders connection, which is back, which is when uh, Dave Kraft. And all I have of that is this one coverless copy, which is embarrassing to hold up, but that was around the office before the cover was printed, printed separately from the cover. You know what? I have a copy here. It's the original. I, I remember where I was when I bought it. We were on vacation in Ocean City, Maryland. I bought it off the spinner rack at the drugstore down there because it was Defenders. And and I will send you my copy. Oh, you don't have to do that. Oh, I want to. You know, so I, I've, I, got a, I've got a fanboy question, Scott. Uh-oh. So getting back to you know the bullpen of the 70s, you're, you're all relatively young guys at that point. Um, and I guess it was what, 77, 78 when, when Kirby came back to Marvel and there was all this fanfare, you know, Jack King Kirby returns to Marvel. That meant nothing to six year old Brian, but you know, I, I did think that devil dinosaur and the Eternals and the mad bomb saga were mind blowing stuff. But what was that like for you guys? I mean, I, I guess for many of you, this was your, your first chance to, to interact with Kirby. No. Well, interact is a strange word considering he was in the West Coast. So, right. uh, he, you know, it, it was not as if he had come in and uh, was now part of the bullpen and you got to see him and rub the flesh and, you know, and get to smell the cigar and all that. And then, he, didn't, you know, he didn't make trips so, up to New York? So, there was, well, there was to be an occasional one, but it was not like with everyone else when you never know who uh, was going to pop in. Uh yeah, and my feeling uh, has always been that neither Stan or Jack were as good separate as they were together. Uh, you know that I always had that feeling, and, and and I have friends who will fight me to the death over that because they they feel that you know Kirby on his own uh, as a scripter was perfectly fine, but I would always read. Uh, the Jack Kirby comics, and even as they were overflowing with magnificent ideas and pacing and adventure and leaping off the page to say, well, boy, we, you know, what if Stan got to script this instead of just printing uh, Jack verbatim? I, I always thought the two of them you know, pushed each other to new heights, even when it was, as would happen later on, when the book would just show up with a couple of sentences from Stan, and it would show in and, and stand with dialogue what had been mostly plotted out by someone like Jack, uh, that, that there was something about the way that Stan would handle the dialogue that sounded a little less stilted and, uh, and, and realer. Than, and that, that was just me. But uh, no, yeah. I, I would agree. I mean, even as a kid, I, I distinctly remember, you know, we're going to talk about it later on in, in this podcast, not this episode, but in, in the podcast. It, the two first comics I purchased were an issue of Defenders, and an issue of Captain America. And even even as a kid, I noticed a drastic difference in dialogue between what Kirby was doing in Captain America and what Steve Gerber was doing in The Defenders. I mean, it was it was night and day. Yeah. Uh, you know, one felt like Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and the other one felt like the grown-up shows that my parents wouldn't let me watch at night. <laughs> well, I do regret, if I, if I have any regret, and I've talked about this with a couple of other people at the time who were tadpoles, you know, people like, you know, Danny Fingeroth and, you know, the other people who were there at the beginning. And you'd, you'd say, well, well, wait a second. I'm in an office with all these elders whose work I am not taking seriously or who, to me, uh, are of the distant past and I'm not valuing them as much as I should. I mean, someone like John Reporton, who was the production manager then and had no finger in any of the creative parts of what Marvel was going on at the time. I mean, I think 
he inked Fantastic Four number four. You know, George Russo's, who was the colorist and doing a lot of the coloring on staff back then, I think he may have done some artwork in action number one. He might have done coloring. I mean, some of the, you wow. know, they were, and, and, you know, and, you, and I think, well, why didn't we? And Saul Brodsky. I mean, I think Saul Brodsky, did he design the first Fantastic Four logo? Things like that, you know, and yeah. why did 19 and 20 year old me not sit down and say, oh my God, tell me what it was like in, you know, back then. And that's what being, I think, a 19 and 20 year old is to some extent. Uh, to being so self-absorbed about the new and the now and what's happening and, oh, look what Jim Starlin's doing and, and things like that, that you're not paying as much attention as honoring the people who who came before. Uh, so, the, you know, so there was some of that going on, and that may be my my main uh, regret. I mean, we're all going ooh-ah over hanging out with Stan Lee, but somehow all these other people who were around in, in different capacities, we were not hammering with questions and say, oh, tell me what it was like, uh, you know, back then in 1963 and 1952 and all of that. Um, so that, that's my big regret out of the comics days. Yeah. I mean, that, certainly that's that, natural, though. You know, I mean, you were busy doing street theater and uh, going to the coffee shop and, you know. That's come, right. You know, I'm, no, I'm serious. I mean, you, that is when you're 19 and 20, you're not thinking about that. It's like it's only when you reach a certain age that you want to hear your aunts and uncles tell stories about when they were kids. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no. So that does come up every once in a while. Oh my God, you mean I was with this person or that person? I mean, and and you know, some of it I was lucky enough to experience and feel awed about at the time. Like uh, you know, Flo Steinberg, who recently passed away, and and we're getting way off the Defenders tangents here, but That's you know, okay. Flo, Flo Steinberg, who was Marvel Comics' second full-time employee, it was her and it was Dan, and she worked there from 1963 to 1968, and she recently passed away, and there was a memorial for her in New York, which, uh, which Marvel you know, fronted the cost for renting a facility at the Society of Illustrators, and, and so we were all able to get together, but... When I was a little kid and I would send a letter to the comics and get a postcard that came back signed by Stan the Gang, that was from Flo. Uh, and when I joined the Mary Marvel Marching Society as a little kid and sent in my nickels and dimes and got it back, that was from Flo. And when I got a no prize, you know, that was from her. And when I eventually went to work at Marvel, uh, with her there was that feeling of connection that, oh, I'm, I'm with this person who was so important to me. Uh, when I was a little kid. Uh, so with with her, I had the sense. And who knows, maybe if Jack Kirby had been in the office, there might have been uh, you know, a different feeling and, and whatever barrier I felt existed might have been uh, broken down to have been in his presence. I mean, I did meet him once or twice at comic book conventions, got his autograph, uh, but there was no, hey, we're peers together working at Marvel Comics kind of thing. He had his own little bullpen out there with Mark Evanier and other people uh, right. putting out those books. Right. All right. Well, Chris, you got anything else before we let Scott get going here? No, I think, I think we're good, Brian. I think we're, uh, we're about out of time anyway, which is good. And I think maybe we should just tell people what we're doing next time. I've lost track now. Uh, next week we will, we will revisit Scott's very first, uh, Credit at Marvel, Giant Size Defenders number five, right? Uh, which kicks off Steve Gerber's multi-part Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh, that's right, right. Giant so, Size number five and Defenders twenty six through twenty nine. That's what we're covering yep. next week. Exactly. Uh, and I so love the Guardians of the Galaxy, and that's another sign of being an old fart because in my head, the Guardians of the Galaxy or the original one is drawn by Gene Colan, and that first issue of Marvel Superheroes, not the ones that have made it into the movie. As much fun as I love the movie ones, but right. uh, you know, there the is a great, little, but uh, yeah, Yondu and Mark Nex and Charlie yeah. Twenty Seven and Vance. <laughs> yeah. So yep, these are these exactly. are fun issues. So is this appearing on its own, or is this coming in after you've already discussed a whole bunch of issues that I haven't heard? Nope. nope this 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 will be appearing on its own next week. I'm so honored. We're honored to have you, and and folks, uh, you know, we encourage you to go check out Scott. Uh, you can visit him online at scottedelman.com. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast, then you should also be listening to Scott's podcast, Eating the Fantastic. Uh, every week he, he interviews uh, folks from science fiction, from horror, from fantasy, uh, really fascinating insight, very deep, uh, you know, just 
deep delving interviews. I've been a guest on there. Um, yes, yeah, over some barbecue. That's right. And coming um, up in a couple of episodes will be my first guest from the world of comics, Marv Wolfman, my former boss, uh, editor, and you know, he wrote Teen Titans for a long period of time and, uh, and a bunch of other books and for Marvel, and he worked with George Perez a lot, uh, will be a guest. And I am very pleased because my first comic convention was 1970 when I was a little kid, and it was a comic book convention. And since the podcast is meant to replicate the fun I have going out to lunch and dinner and everything with friends, uh, it seemed wrong that I'd never had a comic book guest. But I don't know if you ever thought about this. There's a big difference between comic book conventions and horror, science fiction, fantasy conventions. When I go to a fantasy convention or StokerCon or whatever, I'm pretty much on my own. I'll do my panel. I'll do a reading. I'll go to a reading of a friend. Most of the time I'm in the bar. It's easy to take a long lunch. It's easy to take a dinner. But these poor guys at comic book conventions, if you've ever been to one, not just San Diego Comic Con, but the others, they're usually trapped behind their desks, their booths, from 10 until 6. And I've seen them just shoving French fries in their mouth for lunch and never leaving. They can't go out and record a, a podcast over, over a meal or anything like that. Because that, you know, that's my uh, way of doing it. It's like my dinner with Andre, except with me and someone else. So, but I was finally able to rest Marv Wolfman away uh, to talk about all of his uh, time in comics and editing for both Marvel and DC. And one of his early jobs, which you'll want to hear about, uh, when he was an intern at DC, and his job was to destroy artwork. Whoa! You'll want you'll want to hear him talk about that. Oh Man, that's, God, that sounds that's depressing as hell. So, yeah, so, so, so comics fans, tune into that podcast to be <laughs> sad, to be really sad. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> Scott, thank you so much for joining us, folks. I want to remind you if you enjoyed Defenders Dialogue, uh, Chris co-hosts. Three Guys with Beards, along with Jim Moore and Jonathan Mayberry. That's right here on the Project Entertainment Network. And I co-host The Horror Show with Brian Keene, along with Dave Thomas, Mary San Giovanni, and a rotating cast of other uh, guest hosts. And that is also here on the Project Entertainment Network. Uh, while Defenders Scott's Dialogue. is not, I was going to say, while Scott's is not, certainly we must tune into his podcast as well. Absolutely. Eating, Eating the, the Fantastic. Fantastic. Com or iTunes. There we go. Enough said. Uh, enough said. Uh, Defenders Dialogue uh, is available on iTunes, just like Eating the Fantastic. We're also on Android, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Google Play Music, and all other platforms. Our engineer is Tommy Clark. You can check out Tommy's podcast, The Necrocasticon. Uh, let him know we sent you. And uh, if you'd like to advertise on a future episode of Defenders Dialogue, just send me an email, Brian at live.com. Chris, I think we should break tradition. We should let Scott do uh, the, the sign off with you know Excelsior True Believers because we always mangle it every weekend. Anyway. I agree. I agree. Okay, Scott, send Excelsior. us home. Sure, why not? Excelsior True Believers. <laughs> Hey, this is Jamie Ingle of Origins, a bi-weekly podcast that shares the story behind legends and lore, where myth and science meet. If you like stories with a supernatural slant, get your bi-weekly fix every Monday at 4 when I share the origins of things that go bump in the night, urban legends, classic monsters, and current sightings of those creatures who normally hide in the shadows. Plus, each chapter features a short story related to the bi-weekly topic. So go ahead and subscribe, binge, and grab some amazing swag through Project Entertainment Network on Patreon. And if you want to nerd out on transcripts and book links, head over to podcastorigins.com. This has been an exclusive presentation of the Project Entertainment Network. 